So I only have two specialists in this gut here. So I'm going to address the, the address the talk to those of you who are interested, I hope, in the topic, who've got strong stomachs. <laughs> uh, um, and it's just really nice to see such a lot of people come because disgust has been a forgotten topic. Perhaps that's why I didn't title my <laughs> I haven't titled my slide. It's been an area that in fact it was it was dubbed the forgotten emotion of psychiatry a few years ago. Uh, there's been loads of studies on love, loads of studies on fear, loads of studies on, on, on all of our basic emotions. But somehow, disgust is kind of smelly and nasty and it kind of creeps in and contaminates everything and maybe even the researcher who's working in disgust has to work a little bit harder to put a clean dress on today and to, uh, to clean her face and make sure that uh, the, the contamination of disgust doesn't spread to the researcher. So I'm absolutely fascinated by disgust. Um, obviously I am because I've spent a lot of early mornings and weekends writing, write, writing this book. Um, I'm really fascinated about it for two reasons. One, because, well maybe three, I'm just perverse and I like digging into things <laughs> that, that, that no one else wants to dig into. But I think disgust is a fabulous window onto understanding humans as a species. I think it's a great way of thinking about where we come from, why we do what we do, and in the end, if we can understand that, then it's something we can use to do, it, to do things better. Okay, so presumably most of us who are academics work in academia or want to work in academia because we have a desire to, do some, to make the world a somewhat better place. Well, this gets us a great example of how some fundamental understanding about a basic human system, but in fact it's not just, as I'll say, it's not, as I'll say, it's not just a human system, it's an animal system as well, can really provide us with some basic lessons about how to do things better in the world. So I'm going to do two pieces, to talk to you about two things, two, two things. One, fundamentally understanding what disgust is about, and two, what can we do with it? Why is it important? Why it matters to, to understand it? How we can use it to, to make the world a somewhat better place? Um, so what is disgust? So, I don't really want to put you off your lunch, but <laughs> <laughs> I've got a lucky dip here. Who's not eating? <laughs> Go for it. I'll grab a step. What have you got? <laughs> what is this? Somebody's hair. Oh, isn't that lovely? Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Go for it. <laughs> What have you got? Uh, a bloody hanky. Okay. Oh, <laughs> someone with a nosebleed blowing their nose with a hanky. Anybody? Yeah. Anybody like a close look? Take the lid off. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. <laughs> what have you found? Oh, an eyeball. Oh, I love it. Oh, I'm afraid to tell you about it, but uh, here you go. Have an eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> So a morally disgusting act of thief stealing things of sentimental value. Go for it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you think a hardened disgustologist wouldn't mind this. Okay, you go. <laughs> <laughs> It's, a dead fly. it's actually apple juice. Um, <laughs> come on, you escaped so far. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, they, they stopped me at customs yesterday and I was so embarrassed. <laughs> I said I was doing something for Halloween. Here you go. <laughs> oh, it really is. It's horrible. <laughs> I'll let, I'll let you off. I'll let you off. You're a hard and disgusting. What have you got? Some teeth. Teeth. Bloody, teeth. bloody nasty, deformed, bloody teeth. Lovely. Right. Go for it. What have you got? A dog poo. Oh. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Can you find? Oh, a cockroach. Cockroach. Who likes cockroaches? <laughs> <laughs> Worm, lovely. You've got to fill it in. Let me have another one. <laughs> <laughs> Some tube gum. Oh, that's 
gum. Oh. My son chewed my son chewed that gum. <laughs> 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 Oh, can I just give you this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a finger. <laughs> Catch. What have you got? A rich banker arranges his financial. A rich <laughs> banker <laughs> arranges his financial affairs so he hardly pays any tax. Uh, okay. Is that disgusting? Uh, yeah. 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 Maybe not. What about the bags? <laughs> 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 so it's 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 fun, right? But it's it's also kind of serious. Disgusting. Why all those horrible things are disgusting? Why should they all? They're also varied. There's insects. There's certain types of animals, but not other animals. There's excretions coming out of us. There's moral violations. So, seems to be a complete puzzle, a kind of wonderful pile of everything that's revolting and foul, but no clear explanation for why all of those things are disgusting. Um, I, as working as a hygienologist um, in many different countries, I was collecting data from lots of people, from lots of women about why they were hygienic and why they would wash their hands. And they told me that they would wash their hands and get yucky stuff off their hands, but they couldn't explain what was yucky, what was dirty, why certain things were foul and you needed to wash your hands and certain things and, 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 and other things weren't. Um, and I found all these things like, why would fallen hairs be disgusting, for example? Where's the hair gone? There you go. Why is this, why, no, classic disgusting <laughs> why, why should that be disgusting? Well, I was looking up um, a, a peculiar, strange foreign disease in a, that somebody had written to me about in a, in a textbook of infectious diseases. And in the, something struck me from the index. It was fallen hairs were in the index. And mice were in the index, and cockroaches were in the index, and feces were in the index. And it turned out that just about everything in all of my discussed collections were actually there in the infectious disease type <coughs> as vectors or as part of the pathway of the transmission of infectious diseases. Not the moral disgust, and we'll come back to the moral disgust as to whether that really is discussed in a little while. But it was a kind of eureka moment. Um, it, this does actually all make sense. All of these horrible things that make us recoil. Actually seems to be seems to do it for a purpose. It's kind of it's kind of obvious. And you know when you fit on a good theory when half of the people tell you you're completely wrong and the other half of the people tell you it's so obvious it's uh, it's not it's uh, you're not telling us anything new. Um, so we can we this was clearly a hypothesis that we needed testing. So uh, we were, while we were working on this, we were lucky enough to be um, <coughs> brought, um, involved in a TV series about human instincts, and um, we set up a website with the series. And we had we crashed the server that night. Um, we had 150,000 people fill in our survey. It was, it was the biggest ever web survey at the time. Um, it was a set of photos which had been manipulated so that some of them had disease relevance and some of them didn't. So this one, for example, which one would you most like? Which one would you be least likely to eat? <laughs> the yellow. The yellow, and the kind of bodily fluids sort of one, right? So the score is uh, highly significant. With, with 150,000 in our sample, our, our p-values were to die for zero, 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 zero five. Um, highly significant. Which towel would you like to use to wash yourself, to dry yourself with? <laughs> <laughs> So it's the same towel. Right? It's just food coloring, right? But no. <laughs> I'm not going to use that one on the right. So yeah, highly, highly, significantly more, more disgusting. Um, again, perhaps a little surprising. This one. Uh, it's, this is a tube train in London. We don't normally think of them as disgusting. But is it more disgusting when it's full of people or when it's empty? Well, it actually turned out to be more dis highly significantly more disgusting when it's full of people. Other people are the source of pathogens. You are all 
If I had special pathogen glasses and I could detect them, you would glow red. <laughs> Somewhere in the toilet would glow red. Probably around the food stall would glow red. The feet would glow red. So other people probably are the most dangerous thing that we don't want to come into contact with. And so it's not entirely surprising that we find other people somewhat disgusting. So this is the producer of the BBC program, Duncan, and we kind of sprayed a little bit of water at him and painted a few spots on him. <laughs> so which one would you kiss? I don't know which one I would. <laughs> so yeah, twice as disgusting. Uh, Duncan looking sick, looking, looking diseased. So wanting to take a bit further and figure out, try and move on the science of disgust because most of the disgust work that had been done before was based on some rather peculiar theories. Um, we thought time to try and establish um, how disgust works. So we had some hypotheses. We thought probably if it was about fecal, if it was about pathogen ingestion, then there'd be four or five routes by which pathogens could get into us. So probably our disgust system evolved to keep those out. So probably we would have a disgust system that would respond to things that we ate, because that is a, obviously a major route for pathogen ingress. We'd probably have a disgust system that would respond to ectoparasites. So we'd probably have a kind of itch response for any bugs that might be outside us. We'd probably have a response to things we could breathe in. So <coughs> flu, measles, uh, tuberculosis. So the airways are probably protected by, by the disgust system. And then we have another system whereby pathogens can get into us, the genitourinary system. And for, I would, we, would, we predicted that that would also be another route of ingress by which we would have a special disgust that would help us um, protect those routes of entry. Turned out, so, so we did, um, with my PhD student, my PhD student did a, a, another big web survey um, in 2000. Um, uh, we came up with lots of, you have some of his work on your, on your on, uh, and you're welcome to fill it in and compare your results with a normal population, which is on the, the normal population is on the back. Um, the, we had over 70 different stimuli that came from our hypotheses about the different routes of entry. The, uh, the, the factor analysis showed somewhat different responses from what we thought we would find. We found spikes in, of, of, so for example, I'm quite sensitive to insect disgust. I get very itchy and I suffer from something called trypophobia, which is fear of, all, fear of little holes. Does, does anybody have the same thing? You get itchy when you see lots of little round holes in a row. In a row. It, it looks, it actually, you have to realize why, it, it, it actually looks like some parasite eggs laid in your skin. Um, I used to have nightmares as a kid about parasites in my skin. So anyway, I have a particular, I'm particularly high on insect disgust. But lots of people have, they have different patterns, and the, and the way in which we picked out the characteristics of, of, di of, of disgust was different people peeking on different types of disgust. And, and the, the first type you recognize well, the nasty fluid that's been passing around. Um, the second one, animals, but only animals that vector disease, animals and insects that vector disease, and foods. There was some sense that those two would have split apart into two separate um, uh, types of disgust um, had we gone on. And if anybody's interested in doing a PhD, we need to do some more work on, this scales, on these scales because uh, it's not the definitive result yet. Um, we're disgusted by people who are poorly, who have bad hygiene. People who appear to be poorly groomed, who, who leave their dirty, where's the dirty hanky gone? Leave their dirty hankies behind them, who don't flush the toilet. We're particularly disgusted by them. We're disgusted by people of atypical appearance. Um, people who are obese, people who look sick or are behaving strangely. And I'll come back to that because obviously if that is something that is part of our psyche, then it's something we need to know about and we need to deal with. Uh, we're disgusted by sex, by sexual practices that might lead to the transmission of disease, but also odd sexual practices, abnormal sexual practices. We're disgusted by, where's my poo gone? Can I have my 
So, um, so, so I use, I travel with this everywhere, everywhere I go. <laughs> And um, I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be at a meeting and there'll be a plate of biscuits and I'll, I'll sort of pop this in there. <laughs> and then I offer the biscuits around. So I know what people won't eat them. Now that's fomite disgust. That is contamination disgust. And it's something that um, only humans are really good at. They can remember when something has been in contact with something disgusting and then they won't, uh, and then they won't eat it. Uh, and then there's this other category of moral disgust, which is interesting and complex. And we can just talk a bit more about it. So... The argument is that disgust is an adaptive system. I don't want to call it an emotion. I want to call it an adaptive system because no psychologists agree what an emotion is, right? There are, thousands, there are a thousand and one definitions of emotion and there are a thousand and one different lists of what we, what we are, which are the basic emotions. So I'm going to call it an adaptive system. I'm going to say that it is a system that evolved to keep pathogens and parasites out of us, but that it's way older because the problem of pathogens and parasites is almost as old as the problem of free-living animals every free-living animal has got multiple parasites and pathogens. The minute a free-living animal has evolved, yum, it was a free lunch to some other an animal who then very rapidly found their way in and started eating and used it. So the prediction was you would find disgust in the most, in, in the most ancient of animals, right? I can't show you our ancestral animals, but here at least is C. elegans, who only has 302 neurons, uh, it's a pretty simple animal and it's probably a little bit like some of our, some of our ancestors. And now if you put in the Petri dish of C. elegans, this is him here, and we're just going to put into his Petri dish some a parasitic uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, which um, if the worm eats it, the worm will get sick and eventually die. It'll clog up its, um, it'll clog up its, its system. And this is what happens when you put so it's just been put there. He's a millimeter long, this guy. <coughs> yeah, he says, I don't want to eat that. Um, and off I go. Worms his way away. Now, if you do the opposite with the, with the type of bacteria that it likes eating, you see the opposite, of course. It goes straight into... So I would argue that this adaptive system to keep you away and safe from parasites and pathogens is extremely old. And there's a chapter <coughs> in the book that traces uh, parasite and pathogen avoidance in many, many animals, including, um, you know, including some who are, like, who are probably somewhat similar to our, to our ancestral, to animals that are ancestral to us. What's clever about the adaptive system is, I'm always, uh, people always say, well, you know, are you saying disgust is hardwired? What about all the differences from culture to culture? Well, like all emotions, I think, it's a system that tells us what to learn. So every child by the age of two, maybe three, doesn't do this anymore. So <laughs> small children, though some of us who are mothers know that it takes a little time for them to learn that. You don't have to actually do it very often. And a mother's face going, Ugh, helps the child to learn to be potty trained. So... It's, but yeah, if I try to train my child to be disgusted by flowers or chocolate biscuits, I can't do it. So, that, so the adaptive system in our brain tells us what to learn. And that's why in our data, the, the, the Indian mums all say rats are disgusting, but now the Dutch mums said no, rats are fine. Because an Indian mum would, would, would when, a, when a child first sees a rat, would go, ugh, something on a rubbish dump, something carrying plague, ugh, nasty. Whereas a Dutch mum would say, oh, it's a sweet little animal. Um, and so the child wouldn't learn the disgust of the rat, but probably if it met a rat later and had the disgust experience with the rat. So, so that's what's really clever about it. I think that's the way all our motives, our emotions actually work. Um, so it, is this new? Um, well... It is, I suppose, it's certainly different from the standard way of thinking about disgust. He, this guy, Freud, was obviously one of the big, biggest, disgust was really big for him. <laughs> he, should have, he would have been a great disgustologist. I think he was very careful not to call himself a disgustologist, but it was a major part of his thinking. In a nutshell, he thought disgust, he thought the brain worked in a hydraulic way, that, if you, that you might desire your father. 
Um, but you need a disgust to keep you away from desiring your father. You might desire as a baby to put your finger in the poo, but disgust helped to stop you putting your finger in your poo. So it's a sort of regulatory mechanism. It seems a little bit of a contorted way to explain, our, to explain an emotion. Uh, the other kind of grandmother of disgust, so these are sort of grandfather and grandmother of disgust. This is Mary Douglas. She's a great heroine of mine, an anthropologist who wrote the book Purity and Danger. Um, it, very persuasive arguments that she produced that suggested that everything in our, that, that we're very deeply social animals, that we, well, she wouldn't say animals, we're, deep, we're social people, uh, that we need to all agree to a cosmology, to a way of thinking about the world, or things that don't fit, <coughs> that are, are things that are dirty, and they're dangerous to the system. So we classify them as dirty, and we throw them out. So feet on the ground is fine, but feet on the table is, is matter out of place, and therefore it's disgusting and dirty. So I had a major, before, unfortunately she died like a couple of years ago, but before, on her 80th birthday I was invited to, a, to be a, on a panel where we, where we debated whether disgust was something that was uniquely human or whether it was animal. And I don't know. I think I won the argument, but um, <laughs> but all her, it was full of her supporters, and I got a really, I got a really, I got a, they gave me a really hard time. Um, so anyway, so cultural studies all that she's she's grandmother god goddess uh, in in thinking about disgust in, in and culture and cultural variation. So they're the two grandparents, if you like, of um, the current pantheon and disgust who are um, pluralism and uh, John Haidt, um, their theories about disgust still, they're gradually coming around to evolutionary thinking, John Haidt particularly is coming around to evolutionary thinking, but it's still based on Freudian ideas of psychodynamics. Um, disgust serves to, they call it the body and soul emotion, and it serves to police uh, both, our, both the portals of our body and, uh, and, and, the, and the good behaviours in our society. Uh, it helps to keep us from believing that we are animals. Um, it, helps to, uh, it helps to stop us thinking as the terror management theory of disgust. Again, a psychodynamic theory. You know, we're terrified of dying, and therefore disgust is in our brains to help us stop thinking about death, for example. All a bit contorted as far as I'm concerned. Um, so this book is the first one to say parasite avoidance theory of disgust. It's simple, it's straightforward, it explains all of it. You don't need any of these contortions. And if you want to start measuring disgust uh, in psychological studies, you should really think about it that way. And the, 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 that, that scale, as I say, is the beginnings. And I'm hoping that people are going to start using it more than the scales that have been developed before to based on some of these, what I think, pretty wacky ideas about, uh, about disgust. It's, been hard to explain because, it's been, because it is such a diverse, um, it, is, it is such a peculiar um, emotion. So it's the voices of our ancestors telling us what to do. Um, and it's voices that we can listen to if we want, or we have three brains in our heads. You have a, a very ancient um, automatic brain, the one that's keeping you from falling off your chairs at the moment. Um, it's down here, it's kind of basically cerebe a cerebellar brain. You've got your motivated emotional brain in the middle, and we've evolved a rational brain on top. That's why life is a little complicated, because quite often <laughs> brains tell us, our three brains may be pulling us in different directions. Um, so disgust, voices of our ancestors saying, <coughs> stay away, don't look, don't touch, don't eat, don't come into contact with the things that might make you sick. Um, how can, how can knowing that really help us? How can it do something useful for us? What can we, what can we do with that? Um, so I've come to this from the direction of public health and hygiene. Uh, and I just want to show you some examples of some of the things that we've done, we've discussed. Um, this, this video was finally come up. We'll show you. Um, we did careful research on hand washing in Ghana try to understand what it was that might drive handwashing behavior, um, worked with the private sector to come up with a campaign that, was go that, that went national, and it had extremely, come on, oops, it's not there, come back. <laughs> Oh, 
again. Whenever you use the toilet and do not wash your hands with soap, your hands pick up things you can't see. Washing your hands with just water can't make them truly clean. Remember to wash your hands with soap. You never know what you're feeding to your family. For truly clean hands, always wash with soap. So that moment where the child is about to meet the contaminated food, if you, when we pre-tested this with focus groups, mums in Accra, it was a, uh, just an ugh moment, highly disgusting and highly violational of the nurture motive that a mum shouldn't be feeding the stuff to her kids. Um, we got, it was aimed at getting people to wash their hands with soap after the toilet. It actually increased that by 17%. It increased hand washing with soap before eating by 43%. When we did the debriefs on what people had remembered from the ads, they'd actually forgotten the toilet bit. And I think that's one of the lessons. Things that are disgusting are invisible. We actually don't think about them. They actually disappear. They're like black holes. They're bad to think with. Uh, and toilets are something we don't think about. Toilets, we have to think about. Toilets are... 40% of the world has nowhere to go is defecate, are defecating in the open, and we're not talking about it. We're not talking about shit. I have campaigns in my public health work to talk about shit as much as we possibly can, <laughs> because this shit kills. This is responsible for perhaps a million to two million deaths a year, because people don't have toilets. So this, shocking as it is, was a highly effective campaign. This wasn't us, this was some colleagues, um, Lumi Jenkins and others in, in Cambodia. Um, designed this campaign, which the Ministry of Health said, no way, we're not, you're not going to be allowed to use this campaign. But they kept it in with various other options and did the tests and got the evidence and showed that this campaign was the one that everybody remembered that shocked people, that made people remember the importance of toilets, started to change the social norm about, made it visible. Because we, it's just impolite to talk about toilets. There's a fabulous paper by, um, by the professor of poop at Amsterdam University, um, Jacques van der Geest, um, who called Akan shit. Everybody in Ghana always shakes hands with everybody all the time. It's really rude not to. Except before you go to the toilet. And when you go to the toilet in the morning, you're invisible. And it's only after you've cleaned yourself up that you then say hello and good morning and shake hands. So again, an invisible shit being an invisible so we our job in public health and sanitation is to make it visible um, the campaign we've just completed in rural India um, we have we used three different motives we used the nurture motive for mums we used uh, social norms for society but for kids we used disgust and this guy is called Ladu Lingam um, he makes uh, um, ladus which are Indian love, delicious sweet Indian sweets and he makes them <laughs> mixes them all up and then he offers them around to the kids and, the, and the, you get the classic disgust faces on the, on the faces of the kids whereas he, it's cookery competition his, his nemesis is uh, Super Amma who is the super mom who is beautifully clean and makes everything, lo makes everything lovely and those of course handed around to the children the children love it this campaign with just the results are just coming out in Lancet Global Health we got hand washing rates <coughs> from 4% in these communities to 29% uh, to a year after the campaign uh, in a randomized controlled trial in seven villages and seven, and seven controlled villages. Uh, using other things, using Discuss as part of it. It wasn't, the only, it wasn't the only driver of the campaign. But again, a powerful emotion that we can use that makes that, um, that, that, that sticks. Um, <coughs> I think there's a lot more to it that we need to understand about discussed as well in other areas. Um, in psychotherapy, um, and we, we, we um, if 
we're right that there are seven different categories of disgust in our brains, then there are going to be pathologies of those seven different categories. There are going to be people who are very high on some of them and, or, or, and, and very low on others, and that's going to create problems. So perhaps one of the reasons why agoraphobia is common is because other people are disgusting. Um, perhaps we need to see it as a pathology of the, of, of, of the disgust system. Um, there's some evidence in the literature that um, anhedonia, in other words, people being disgusted by themselves, can ruin their sex lives, for example. And people who have had a disease or an infection or a, or, or, or a wound of some sort, like fistula, for example, so disgusting that they can't have, have, have normal sex, yet so shameful that people will not admit to it. And I think one of the things that people working in, in, in mental health need to understand is that disgust is there as a strong pathology. We need to be looking for it, looking for, looking for uh, people who, are, who have, and often may have a, maybe have comorbidities um, on. So OCD, for example, we think of it as a fear pathology, but actually people who have been raped or have had to deal with grisly bodies in war, for example, suffer from the same sort of flashback. And this is, a, this is a disgust pathology, not a, not, not a fear pathology. It needs to be treated similarly. Um, so people with too much, people with too little disgust. Um, I, I think people who, I don't know if you agree, but people who are disgustologists on the whole have pretty low levels of disgust. When I did a launch in, uh, in London for, for the book, um, we did, we, everyone filled in these, uh, these questionnaires on a big board. And we showed that people who came to a disgust lecture were much lower on disgust than your, than your normal population, which is kind of what we predicted. Um, if you're low on disgust, you're hard to live with. My partner will tell you. <laughs> because you, you, you know, your, your continence with your bodily fluids is perhaps not the best. <laughs> your emanations, your interesting, your, your hygiene levels may not be as good. Now, I, there, that, I mean, that's funny, you know, and I, I can just about, you know, just about cover up my lapses and get by socially. But people who, who have Huntington's disease or, have, or, or um, uh, Asperger's, for example, um, quite often have real problems with bodily hygiene. And as a result, social stigma, stig stigmatization is a massive issue. It's one of the last taboos. It's one of the last stigmas. People who are sick, ill, who look, who look uh, unkempt, who look un unhygienic, um, who, who, for one reason or another, are not able to sort of project the normal in image of not being a parasite danger to other people, are discriminated against. They're discriminated against in the health sy system. Uh, they're discriminated against in, 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 um, in the social, in, in social services. And uh, okay, just, you know, you and I probably can think of times when we've got hurt. Because <coughs> it's an emotional labor caring for people who are sick because it's disgusting. And we have to deal with that. Nurses know that. It's, big, it, it's no good just saying, it's irrational. You shouldn't be feeling disgust. Oh, we'll, we're all good. We can overcome it. It's hard work to overcome. It's difficult to care for somebody who is sick, who is in your in your home, or, or, or it's because of you have to overcome this this, this atypical appearance response. Um, and then I haven't really got time to go into the story of moral disgust. There's a lot of evidence. Well, let's say. I think the jury is still out on whether moral disgust really is part of the disgust adaptive system or not. There's a lot of reasons why it probably probably is. So disgust, if you think about the things that elicit disgust, many moral infractions actually involve bodily fluids. So rape, child abuse, bullying, uh, wounding people. Um, have an organic disgust. People who, th those examples I, I gave you, people who are behaving like social parasites, we feel we want to exclude them, to shun them, to not look, to not touch, to not, well, even eat, but <laughs> to keep them out of our lives. And so the, the adaptive response to moral infractions is pro probably makes a lot of sense that we try and exclude people from our society who are morally that dubious. Um, if we didn't do that, we wouldn't make people pay the price of their antisocial acts. And as a result, you let them get away with it. 
So the evolution of morality is a, is a hot topic in, in evolutionary biology. There's a, there's a lot of it in the book, which if you're interested to follow that, uh, follow that thread through. But I think we have got enough evidence to at least have a strong hypothesis that um, the things that occasion discussed in the moral domain, plus the, the fMRI work that's showing some of the same parts of the brain being engaged by moral infractions, plus showing facial expressions of disgust are exactly the same with moral infractions, plus the behavioral responses are very similar. In my view, if it sort of sounds like a bear, looks like a bear, runs like a bear, it probably is a bear. Um, but I think we, we, we've got more work to do to explain the moral domain of disgust. And, 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 but I do think we need to know about it because if we want to write the world a better place, we have to recognize that our ancient ancestors are telling us two, two important lessons. One is shun the body who is a social parasite who is exploiting other people. But it's also telling us to shun the outsider, shun the person who is odd, shun the person who is different. Again, the outsider would have been more likely to have been a cause of disease. And actually, in our evolutionary past, it's probably only in the last 20 years or so, we've realized that outsiders are actually the same race as us. They're actually the same genetically speaking. Science has told us that genetically speaking, foreigners are the same as us. But go back 100 years, no one believed that. But throughout our evolutionary history, we've seen others as animals. We've seen other tribes as animals and as disease threats. So that is there in our psyche too. We have this capacity. And politicians exploit us. They exploit the fact that, that we are xenophobic. And they start talking about immigration at election time. Uh, and they start using the language of cockroaches when you're a Tutsi and you want to exterminate the Hutu, for example. It is, uh, it, is, it is a tendency that's there in our brain that can be exploited. And I guess one of my reasons for us wanting us to understand all this so much better is that if we know what's going on, we can laugh at these stupid politicians. We can see what tricks they're playing on us. We can use this sort of top-level brain to t shut down the voices of our ancestors when they're telling us things that aren't, that aren't things that are useful for us. So, disgust tells us something about what it means to be human, really. It tells us how our ancestors shaped something that's a bit like an organ in our brain that tells us to do things that were good for our ancestors. It may not be telling us to do quite the right thing that's good for us today, but it was shaped through a long evolutionary past of fighting pathogens, staying away from pathogens and parasites. But if we understand it better, we can do better in public health, we can do better in public policy, and we can enjoy Halloween because we can understand much better what's going on at, at Halloween time. I was going to stop by and take a photo of some of your wonderful doorsteps with all these disgusting things spread across them. <laughs> it's a great example of why People love playing with disgust. Disgust is great to play with. We love to take our emotions out for a spin and see where, see where it takes us. But it's also really serious. And that's why I wrote the book. And that's why I hope you'd be interested to read it. I want to thank all of the people who were involved in the book. My partner, particularly Robert Oranger, who did, who did a lot of the think who did co-thinking for me for the work. Um, thanks to Joe for organizing the talk. And to Duke for me and uh, happy to take questions or have my disgusting things thrown back at me. <laughs> 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 Any questions? Yes. Go for it. Um, yeah, you mentioned all the pros for uh, moral as a category for disgust. What were the arguments against it? Okay. Um, just going to ask me Um the arguments are uh, that it's just a metaphor. It's just, um, it's handy to say that disgust is, that, that you just find it disgusting because it's a bit like, you know, the, the organic thing is disgusting and, and a, people, a person who behaves badly, you just say, I think that's the main argument. I think that, you know, that's the one we have to, if we're gonna, um, the, the, the fMRI, Evidence is a little equivocal, I would say. Some systems are definitely common, but some systems aren't. But that would be what you would expect because you've got a process, a different sort of stimulus. If you still run it through the anterior insula, which is where it's largely. What was the question? Yeah, 
what would you think? Would you think? Are you, do you think it's can, do you think it's the same or not? I mean, I th the trouble is, we, we we use feelings as a way of determining whether it's an emotion or not. And I I've actually you you saw what I did. I took emotion, took feelings out of emotion. The lay definition of emotion is feelings. I think the reason we have feelings is so that our level three brain can work can understand what's going on in our look down and what, look up what's going on in our level two brain. So if you have a feeling that the food is going to go off, you'll put it in the fridge today and you won't be faced with a horrible mess tomorrow. So feelings help us use the theater of our imagination to help us be better at doing a planning. Um, and, and I think that's probably uniquely human. And I think that's why we're confused about whether animals have discussed or not. Uh, but it's so, sorry, what do, you, what, do you, what do you think? Do you think it's the same or not? I really enjoyed uh, taking this quiz. And one thing I wonder, I mean, so by my assessment, some have greater pathogenicity than others. They're, they're riskier. And um, has anyone attempted to look at either historical, I mean, in, in, in ancient history through evolution and in modern cases, like the relative pathogenicity compared to the level of disgust? Mm. I mean, some of these, when I'm looking at the, the normal averages, they seem far off, but just by my guess. So, so one of the complexities, obviously, of telling a st an evolutionary story about where, uh, about why an, an organ or an, an adaptive system like discussed evolved is that you're, you don't know what the disease patterns were in the ancient past. Um, I suppose one reason why this all came into clear focus with, for me was I lived in Africa for 10 years, and in Africa, 65% of people died of infections, whereas in America, less than 5% of people died of infections, and I'm presuming that's more like the ancestral condition being beset by parasites as, and, and pathogens is normal. Now, exactly what the shape of those, those diseases were, they will have been different in the past indeed. But I don't think that negates the big point that there is the force. There's the for, I mean, we're used to the idea that um, we have a, a fear system in our brain that keeps us from running into the arms of lions or snakes or, or saber-toothed tigers. Um, because it, our, the ancestors that did that would have been would have gone extinct, but the ancestors who went around going, "Oh, yummy poo," <laughs> give me yeah. still some food in there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they wouldn't have passed. They wouldn't have made it so successfully. They wouldn't. Their, their children. They would have had fewer children, and those children they had would have died out. And, and, and as a result, all of your great 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 ancestors are people who did not like going, "Ah, yummy poo." Um, so. It, it, it's the, I forgot what your question was. I'm <laughs> <laughs> rabbiting. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's the evolutionary component, and, I mean, and then there's also, I mean, you know, some of these are, are learned. Like when, when you live uh, in another country, you sort of, you can adjust, you know, like you gave the, the Dutch rats versus Indian rats, you can sort of adjust your, your disgust over time and, or learn it in other contexts. And so I was curious if, um, you know, if, if there's any way to look between, I mean, you have disgustologists or maybe health professionals that their disgust was sort of more right, rationally okay. modified yeah, yeah. by the level of pathogenicity of the thing yeah, they're disgusted that's, about. That's a really, really good question. Um, so we're not used to thinking of dividing our brains into these two pieces, this sort of ancestral voices of the motives and the modern scientific knowledge. Um, it's a tool I use all the time to try and understand <coughs> human behavior and, uh, and to try and change it. I think it really helps to clarify uh, what's going on. So y you're, you have the ancient tendency to be disgusted by things that smell bad, that have cues that they might contain parasites. But if you are then told that there are germs in your food, the germ becomes a word for disgust. So the reason that education about germs changes our behavior is probably not because you've learned the rational... In fact, all of our campaigns, we have rules that we're not allowed to talk about germs in our campaigns. And you saw that ad, didn't, we didn't talk about disease or germs, and it works because that's brand new. It's something we've only discovered. Past, when did Pasteur discover germs? I mean, they were, they were discovered like three, 300 years ago, but, but we have, they've only become common knowledge really in the last 50 years. Everybody knows about them now. So, I think we have really ancient systems that keep us away, keep us safe from disease. 
and sort of modern rationale has been built on top of it. We can still work with the ancient system, and modern rationale can help us too, but I like to keep them separate. Yeah. Joe? So I have a question that sort of piggybacks a bit on that. It's about the hygiene hypothesis. And um, so the idea that, um, that we're actually protected by some exposure to yeah. pathogens, and it's obviously just still a hypothesis, but there's some evidence there that some pathogens we've actually evolved over a long period of time to actually help us to coexist with. So how do you explain evolutionarily right. us yeah. kind of perhaps going too far and having too hygienic of an Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's a really interesting question. It's, a, it's, a, it's what I call a mismatch problem. So first of all, we didn't actually evolve for pathogens to be good for us. We evolved for to have a to, to live in a world full of microbial flora, some of which are pathogenic, the vast majority aren't. So if you lived in, so in an ancient world, you'd be drinking water that would be full of plasmodia, it would be full of multiple species of bugs. So you would be getting prime, your immune system would be set to deal with multiple bugs, not necessarily pathogens. Um, so, but we're in a modern world where we can do anything we like. We can have, I've just built a, got a, a new house and my pride and joy is my bathroom. It shines. It is, <laughs> it, every surface is, is sort of silver or, 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 or chrome or, or mirror or, or the tiles are, uh, the tiles are shy, the floor shines. Um, I want that because I don't want crap in my life. And that's why it's beautiful. It's why it shines. It proves there's no bodily fluids on my tiles in my bathroom. Um, so everybody wants because that, we like it because that's what disgust, no one wants to be disgusted. So we've built up the world that we want but not necessarily the world that's good for us. And that, and that, that, that holds true for a lot of our motives. In fact, we've built a world that gives us all the food we want it all of the time. And I can't believe it when I'm in your country and see that there is food available every Ten minutes, you have a food break, <laughs> <laughs> and how I would feed the size of a house. Anyway, if I lived in your country, but <laughs> the, the, so this is a mismatched story that we've built the world we want, but not necessarily the ones good for. So it is quite likely that we do that we do need more. Uh, so there are a number of studies now showing that if you give people um, benign worm infections, that it can actually reduce. Uh, uh, um, uh, so it's not that we are of, uh, continuing to evolve um, genetically to be more hygienic. It's that these core base uh, ideas, or ideas discussed, are there, and those are, all, and in our modern world, we're just allowed to be more hygienic. Yeah, we do what we want. We, which, yeah, we want a nice, clean, shiny world. We love it. And we, don't we like wanted that 100 years ago, just couldn't have it. Technology, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're 100 times more efficient at turning resources into, at, at, at using energy to make, so everything's got cheaper. We're getting better and better, technologically speaking, and it's made a massive difference to the world. So, um, so now, it, so one of the things I didn't talk about was, um, a student's just done some research in Nepal on, on manners and uh, disgust and um, menstrual hygiene. A uh, big issue. Women in, in rural Nepal um, are, if, during, during their period, are not allowed to cook and are not allowed to sleep, in the, sleep in, the, in the same room and have to go. And indeed, some women actually die of exposure because they have to sleep outside in the cow shed. And it's, it, seems very, it seems very harsh, but yet in, in, in the UK, in my mother's time, menstruating women couldn't make bread because the bread wouldn't rise. And in Italy, you couldn't make the sauce uh, if you were, you couldn't make the, the spaghetti sauce because uh, because you're menstruating. But nowadays, the modern Nepali women have got tampons, and so there is no blood. It, the, the technology has solved the problem, and as a result, there's no longer this problem that you might contaminate the world with your menstrual blood, and that helps to um, that 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 means they aren't now being forced to be segregated during during the periods, for example. So technology is doing a lot of doing, changing the world in many, many, many ways, for better, for good. Yes? Uh, I'd like to take you one step further. Okay. Disgust, you recognize it, but you're in an environment where you cannot change it. Yeah. 
how do you how does the acceptance part happen? Actually, I'm not sure. Uh, there's there's a, there's evidence both ways that um, you can desensitize so that if you're if you have a job that involves having to deal with disgusting fluids, you, your top level brain can kind of shut it off. We, we, and we do, and we've seen, we have this ability to not think about it, to put it away in the black hole and make it not part of our lives. But on the other hand, there's, there's the equivalent studies which show that you can become sensitized to it and the more that, that, that you have to live in disgusting conditions, the more traumatic it is. Um, I don't know the answers to how, how we help people deal with, I think it's one of the questions that needs I don't know if you've got any thoughts. No. I don't know about how you... Wish I did. How we make it easier. But to make it invisible somehow. But so one example, my um, a dear friend was in hospital in Geneva um, and um, was being... Uh, and of course, Swiss hospitals. You, know, you want to be in a Swiss hospital. Boy, they are lovely. And the food is amazing. Absolutely fabulous food. Um, but he was anorexic. He was very sick and didn't want to eat the food. So he says, Val, have the food. I'm sitting there, I'm hungry, and I go, I can't eat it because it's in hospital. And, and I think there's a, there's, there's one, it is a big problem in healthcare that people don't want to eat. And, and if, you're, if the food you're providing is then contaminated, apparently contaminated because it comes from a hospital kitchen, then it's going to make it worse, isn't it? So the only answer is we were coming up with was the idea of kind of making very wholesome food in kind of bright blue bowls. Remember, blue is something you disgust, and so sort of make it all look very natural and, and, and make it produ produce it in a kitchen that is not a hospital kitchen, or find a you know a clean corner that isn't host that doesn't shout hospital at you for people to eat, for example. So it might be, but the, that's just a random thoughts about how you might go against disgust to help people who are in hospital. Plus, yeah, so um, you earlier mentioned social stigma, and so I wanted to prod a little bit um, and ask about the Indian man, the sweet maker, right, so that campaign that you mentioned. Um, and if we can all kind of think of that image, right, so the kids, um, you know, see the, the feces and the snot and, like, it's in the food and it's gross, um, but the brain is really good at making associations, and so I wonder how you think this campaign or something like this might also propagate unwarranted disgust. Absolutely. For example, for obese people, because they happen to be really large, or is that something we want? Is that something we no, should avoid? That's a really great question. Um, it's a particular one in the um, in the sanitation campaigns, and it's a really hot issue. Uh, in um, There's a program, uh, one of the fashionable programs at the moment on sanitation in developing countries is called CLTS, it's Community Led Total Sanitation. There is this triggering process that involves um, doing, sometimes they call it the walk of shame, where you walk around the village and you see where all the, you, you bring it to life, you show people, you, you, you dip um, uh, dip a hair in some of the pieces you find and then you dip it in the, in the water from the village pump and you say, look, this is what's happening. Feast, your feces are getting into the water. And the sort of shock and disgust triggers the community to say, right, what are we going to do about it? And they get together and they decide. But some, but it's done. It has been done in many, many places, and it's done differently in different places. And some people come up with this bright idea that they give whistles to the children, so that if they see somebody defecating in the open, they'll blow the whistle. Now, highly effective at stopping people defecating in the open. But of course, who are the people who are defecating in the open? They're the poorest. They're the ones who can't afford to build the toilet, and um, and so it's really difficult to get the balance right. Um, I guess I defend myself to some extent with these sorts of campaigns with the sense that you know we, we're all marketed to um, we, for example we're all made to feel too fat we're all made to feel too poor we're all made to feel we can't afford the big car and that, that only the elite can afford it and, and it's, it's, it's part of the world we live in that, that we're all made to feel bad because that makes us buy stuff um, and maybe we're just using the same tricks. Um, so we're not any worse, anyway, than what, <laughs> than, what, than, what uh, than what than what capitalism does to people. <laughs> uh, are we better? I think we are, because we think very hard about this and try and avoid it if we can. But, but it is, it's a difficult balance. And 
certainly stigmatizing and shaming people is not the way to go. All right, I'd like to thank Val so much for coming. Mm -hmm.